Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as I said, that I was uh, I was grown up in uh, in a city, so I didn't knew the 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 culture in the uh, in the rural areas. So uh, I had a friend, which was uh, we both were quite naughty, I would say. We were um, because I was first in the classroom, so I was taking the um, the register book with me when we didn't want the teacher to teach, and I was climbing to the tree with the register book, so the teacher had no register book to to check the the students if they were present or not. Uh, and it was, I have to say that it was really good time. So we were not afraid by climbing to the tree, and it was co-education school. We were climbing to the highest uh, tree in the, uh, in the surrounding of the school. So this was happened again when I was, um, the, when the war began uh, in 82, I moved to our, um, to our village. And I already had my son, which was, was five years old. So we went there and I took a small plastic bucket in order to collect mulberry from the tree. There's a nice uh, sour mulberry, uh, which is very difficult to collect them. The normal mulberries is, is easy. You shake, they fall down. You put something under. But this one doesn't fall down with the shaking. So I climbed to the tree in order to collect uh, the small brief for my son. My son was sitting under the tree and I uh, climbed up. And my mother-in-law, he was uh, shouting and asking, and I thought maybe this tree is not belong to us. So I didn't pay attention. I said, I already in the tree, so I have to collect some mulberry. She came closer and I said, this tree is not belong to us. So I thought that this tree is not belong to us. We are, I'm stealing the other people's mulberry. She said, no, this tree is belong to us, but women do not climb the, the trees. <laughs> this is in the rural area <laughs> of Afghanistan. So I was, um, I was so naive because I thought that uh, why not? I mean, for me it was uh, a big surprise that why women cannot climb the tree. But this shows that how, first of all, uh, the situation was good in, in Afghanistan, that we climbed the tree in the city, in normal situation. But in the rural area when I went, I didn't know the culture over there, that women should be more uh, a patient or should be more obedient. I would say. So that is the climbing of tr tree, my personal experience. But then the, the, the family that you grew up in was quite liberal, was it? Well, I think my, my father had two wives, and we were 11 children, and all of us, we got education. But of course, the boys were preferred, which was very natural. Uh, then the girls. Uh, when I gra finished my school, I had to marry in order to go to get education in the university. So that was not imposed on the boys. So you had to marry before you went for the education? Uh, for the university education, yes. Still, uh, you could go for the education? Yes, I think I, I have to say that I um, uh, my husband was uh, really a good person. He was already professor in the university. He promised that he will facilitate um, that I could continue my education. I think he did everything uh, for me to, to continue my education, but we were just, uh, we lived for, uh, we lived together for four years. And then he was taken by the regime on that time one night uh, from home and he never returned and I have no news from him. He was taken with his three other brothers, so four brothers from one family. All taken? All taken arbitrarily. We don't know when and how uh, and why and where they killed. And which year was that? This was 79. 
So 75, I, um, jo I went to the university and we married in 75. 79, he was taken. And I was st still a student in the university. And that happened to many people at that time? Yes, to a lot of people, particularly the one who was not thinking like the government or who were not the pro-Russian. The people who were religious, the people who were um, educated, intellectuals, and not supportive of their opinion in uh, the Russian invasion inter interference, the USSR on that time, uh, they were taking arbitrarily. The normal people were taken from the street. I mean, normal, a boy who was selling something on the street, he was taken and he never returned. That's why the people stand. Uh, against and resist. So what did you do after that? Well, I um, actually, when, um, before he, my husband was taken, some of his relatives was already taken. And, and they were, uh, on that time we were saying they are in prison, but they were, we don't know if they were in prison, if they really killed them that same night. Uh, he told me that I should not go uh, and look for him because I was um, I'm very bold as you know that I say everything very uh, loudly and he said you they might arrest you also so we had already a son which was one year old and then uh, what should we do so you just continue your studies but then uh, the people who came to take him was leaded by his student from the university and uh, he, he said that he will take him for maybe, maybe for two hours, not for long, but he never returned. So we were I, before his thoughts uh, that he was too radical and too critical of the regime? Actually he was not in, very much involved on those uh, activities, but he was teaching in the two faculties in Polytechnique and also in, in science. He studied in Russia. He had a master degree on uh, solid physics. So it was, uh, I, because, I mean, they, the one who was not with them, even if they had no uh, political activities, um, they were taken. And of course, it was very difficult because um, for me, and he was the, the one who was working and bringing money in, in the family for me to continue my studies. Then it was a um, difficult time and I had to, to go another four, three years to finish my studies. But uh, I was knitting, I was sewing clothes for the other people, I was doing embroidery in order to be able to continue my studies. And beside that, I, ha I was going to almost one day a week to different offices to find out where he is and to the biggest jail that we had uh, in Kabul. Uh, almost every Friday I was going there in order to find out because some people who were there and they were at least taking the clothes. But I never found out where he was. Uh, how did you choose your major in the university? Well, actually, uh, we had the, we have a concours exam. And then the highest, you choose the uh, faculty. And the major exam, actually, the, the exam, um, you choose what topic you want or what profession want you want. So medical is the highest. So when you have the highest number, you can go to the medical. So I was interested to be an engineer, a road construction engineer. I don't know why. Uh, that was my dream that I would be an engineer on the road and having this helmet on my head. But then uh, while I was entering to the classroom, my elder brother was with me. He said, uh, think again, put medicine first 
and then engineering. If if you got the number, then you always have choice. Um, if you have the high number, you always have choice. You can change your your opinion and idea. So I put medicine first, and then engineering. So I got a very good number, a very good mark. And that's why the university was uh, giving me uh, a scholarship to go to study in Australia. But uh, my father didn't allow me to go. Yeah? But then uh, when I came, then I married and I came to university. Because I had a good mark, they gave me another scholarship, uh, mechani mechanical engineering in Hungary. I did all the uh, paperwork, even the medical test also, and my passport all was almost ready. And then I said, uh, what do I do with the, uh, it's mechanical car repairing or track repairing. And I thought, that's too much to lie under the car and do, and <laughs> do the work. One, two, if I learn the Hungarian language, it's only used in Hungary. So it's not, the, the language is not the international language and the job is not uh, what I want. I mean, the road, road construction is different than the mechanical engineering to, to repair a car. Then I decided not to go and continue with medicine. Then, of course, uh, when I was when I graduated from the university, I worked uh, only four months in a hospital in Kabul, and I chose the internal medicine. Then, after four months, I left Kabul and I went to our village, which was already free, was not under control of the government, and it was under control of so-called mujahideen, but it was. The, the local people. Then that was an experience because I, um, as I said that I, the first, maybe the second day I climbed to the tree and it was difficult because I, I didn't know the culture. But I think I, um, quickly the people accepted me the way I was. I was wearing the uh, male shalwar kameez with a small scarf on my head and then I was doing medicine. I did everything because there were no female doctor. There were no doctor at all. Uh, only MSF was there. Uh, but they, I, they didn't have uh, qualified doctors. They were dealing with the first aid. So first thing I did, I went to MSF and I asked for some uh, some pyodine and gauze and, and things that I need, need for a pansman. Some uh, They gave me some um, pants uh, because I had only a stethoscope and a BP apparatus because it was difficult to leave Kabul. If they catch me on the way, I, I were a burqa, then would have been problem. So I would have been gone also. Then I was there really helping people. I was walking for 12 hours to reach a patient by feet on very difficult uh, rocky mountains. I was riding um, horses. I was riding donkeys to reach the patients. And sometimes it was really difficult because of what when I was arriving, she was already died. So I remember one woman, she had transverse uh, um, position of the baby. She was in labor for three days. And these people came and asked me, so we had to, and part of the road we went by uh, Russian Jeep. And then part of it, we, I went by horse. But then I was afraid to, because the, ho the, the road, was too difficult. Then I walked. We arrived in the village and she already died because I think she died because of uh, rupture of uterus. They pulled and pulled the baby. The, the baby, of course, it was transferring. The one hand was out. 
So it was uh, quite difficult, but I enjoyed doing that for the people. Um, after three years, then uh, it was difficult for me because I sent my son back to Kabul to be with my mother uh, to, to go to school because there were no school there. And, but I got kind of tired and I began to cough a lot. And I thought it might be tuberculosis. I went to this MSF doctors. They said, no, there's no sign of tuberculosis. There were no other facilities or x-ray, nothing. But they were just listening with stethoscope. But it turned to be open cough. Open cough is a viral disease that these days it doesn't exist because they, the people get the vaccination. But on that time it was a lot and I got open cough and I lost a lot of weight because I was coughing and coughing and I was throwing the, f the food I was eating. So I was really afraid that I caught, it was a lot of tuberculosis in the, in the area. Maybe I caught tuberculosis. I didn't want to begin the tuberculosis treatment without uh, having the, all the signs of, of uh, tuberculosis. So then I went to Pakistan in uh, November 84. There I stayed for 17 years. One, seven years. But then soon I began to work in the hospital for um, Afghan refugee on the female branch of it. And then I was going to the camp, which was two and a half hour drive every day, going to the camp and two and a half coming back from the camp. Uh, and it was um, my own people, so I was uh, feeling more more responsibility to, towards them and more solidarity with them. Then I began the, when I saw that there's no school, there's no practically health um, facilities for women. One day I went early morning because I usually, I was going earlier than any other doctors, than the Pakistani doctors. And I was leaving the last one because I was finishing all the patients. It, the time was not uh, a big issue for me. Um, I arrived in the hospital, it was early, uh, before everything was open at 8. So I think it was 15 to 7 or 20 to, uh, to 8. When I arrived in the hospital, there was a young woman who came with the eclampsia. And she was pre uh, pregnant for the first baby. She had convulsion, convulsion and I ran here and there. The delivery room was closed, then I ran to the pharmacy, pharmacy was closed, so I referred her to another Pakistani hospital, which was not very far, but she died. And then I decided that I should uh, start a hospital. Then I went to the, the person who was funding this part of the hospital and I said, uh, can I have some money for, uh, to establish a hospital? And he said, um, uh, well, the Mujahideen will burn our office because, as I said in my speech, that nobody was paying attention to women. Women were really out of out of agenda, non-existence. So um, then I told him that it was an elderly British man. I told him that I will not tell anyone that uh, who's funding me. So if you can give me some money. He said, okay. Uh, then I began a hospital for women and children. Uh, within that hospital, I began quickly the uh, female nurse training or midwife training, because we didn't have a lot of Afghans. Uh, and we had a lot of Afghan refugees, but with Pakistani female nurses, it was a little difficult because they, they don't speak the same language. So it was um, an experience. So I opened that hospital and it was, I was harassed a lot by the fundamentalist political parties, Afghan fundamentalist political parties, and also by the Pakistani police. But I continued, then I slowly began the, uh, a girls' school. 
Then it was interesting because the foreign minister of Norway came and saw the hospital and he was so impressed because the whole street was full of uh, patients. It was a small street like this one. The end of the street was blocked and um, it was 300 women sitting. And he was so impressed the work you are doing. What can I do for you? And I said, can you give me money for hospital? Because in the area when I was working, there was no hospital. There was nothing. So I said, can you give me some money for the hospital in Afghanistan? And he said, yes, why don't you bring me some proposal? Uh, this is 88, and I, it was the first time when I heard about proposal. I never heard before. <laughs> so I asked, I came back home. We had dinner together. And I called an Afghan architect. I said, uh, a friend from the same village. I said, I need you. And he said, what? And I said, I want you to um, draw a map for a hospital. And of course, I didn't have experience, and he didn't have experience on, on hospital. Uh, so we draw something. I took it next morning at 10 o'clock to this um, Mr. Minister. And he said, yes. After maybe two weeks or so, he sent the money, and I began the construction of hospital. This is June 88 in that area. Now it's a big hospital. It's a 50-bedded hospital. It's one of the best hospitals in, in district level in the country. It took four year, uh, years. It was looted different time, different time by the Mujahideen group because they wanted, they were saying, no, she's not Muslim, and she's, I mean, uh, my argument, even if I'm not a good Muslim, so what the hospital does to you? It's for your people. So I resist, I didn't give up. Then next year, um, the, in 89, they invited me to Norway. So I came to Norway and then I went to Sweden and I came to Holland. That was my first trip in Europe. Uh, and then the I brought the photos of the construction of the hospital to this minister and he said, well, what can I do, Sima, for you? And I said, can you fund some school? And he said, yes, how much? I was running uh, a school with 500 students for $1,000 per, per year. So he gave me $10,000. So I began 10 school and uh, under the tree or in the mosque. Then slowly we constructed a lot of uh, school. Then in the hospital, actually, we began to, to bring uh, couples, either sister and brothers or husband and wife, from very remote part of the uh, central Afghanistan, and train them in the hospital as a nurse and midwife. And then we were able to send them to a very remote part of the country. Then we were establishing a small clinic, and we were give, giving them the basic uh, material and some medicine. So they were running that clinic. And I think currently, 80% of the of the female uh, of the health staff, not doctors but the other health staff, in the central uh, part of Afghanistan, trained by us by this hospital and then I began another hospital, a school. Um, I think I have to say that uh, we built 115 schools in, in different parts of the country and more than 100,000 students are going to, to those schools. And uh, the district I come from when I began the first hospital and school Actually, no child now has at home. All is going to school. It was very, very rewarding, I would say. Last year I went uh, because there was, in this 35, 36, 37 years, we have not heard from our um, missing people. So finally there was a list of uh, 
5,000 people released by the um, Dutch uh, public prosecutor because an Afghan who was working with the intelligence service during the Russian, he came to Holland to uh, apply for asylum. Then uh, on his paper he said that he was, he tortured people and he killed a lot of people in order to get asylum. Then he uh, presented a list to the um, public prosecutor in order to prove that he was, so his life is in danger. So of course the um, Dutch did not give him asylum, but they did not bring him to justice also. He died. And then the public prosecutor of Holland said that they are going to release the, the list. So uh, my husband's name was not there, but the two brothers' name was there. So we went to have kind of a funeral. Uh, then I went there, we uh, built a small memorial uh, something for those missing and we wrote their name because all those families for, um, for 38 years we waited for our missing people so I'm still looking for some some money to have a library over there at least when the people comes and uh, it should be because the majority of them were educated, intellectual, who were taking an arbitrary killed, and no one is responsible for them. So when I went there for this funeral, then it was early morning, I just walked to the village, because, because of the security, they don't allow me to walk alone, so I just escaped uh, the the boundary wall, the, the boys who were sitting on the, on the door, they were, um, one of them went to, to bring breakfast for the others, so they were busy, it was a little cool, so they were inside the small <laughs> room and I just slipped out and I walked in the village. Uh, two young girls, uh, around six, seven year old, they were holding each other's hands and they were running. And I stopped them, I said, you didn't say salam, you didn't say hello. Then they uh, waited, hello, oh salam, and, and I said, where are you going, why are you running? Um, we got late, we are going to a course, and I said, which kind of course? English course. And I said, which class you are in, are you going to school? Yes, one said I'm in second grade, the other one said I'm in first grade. And do you know the Persian alphabet that you are going now to learn English? Of course we know. And then I thought, my God, nobody will defeat us. Nobody will defeat us and this is the resistance against the extremists and violence and, and um, aggression. So, fighting here and there, but I have to say that uh, I've gone through a very difficult time in life, uh, but I'm satisfied with the, the sacrifice that I did. I have a reason now. I mean, I was talking in Freiburg last Friday and there was a boy who was sitting there who was doing his PhD in Germany and he gone to school, I began to the, in their village. And he came up and he said that I owe you, it was because of you that we gone to school. In fact, all of her, his family, the elder brother is doctor, he's getting his PhD, he's medical doctor, and he's getting his PhD on mathematics. And the two sisters of him gone to school and graduate from university. He says it was all because of you, otherwise 
we were not better than the other villages in the other districts. And of course they um, they looted the school also, they took the construction material, medicine, ambulance several times and they put their um, heavy weapon doshakas on top of the hospital to fight with the others. But I did not give up. I'd gone through a lot of uh, sleepless nights for and then when it came, when it was Taliban time, because we had the high schools for the girls, and they were sending a letter that the, clo the girls' schools should be closed, and then of course the local people, the local mullahs, their religious scholars, they went to Taliban and said that uh, we encouraged them, because they had their own girl daughters in the school, go and talk to them because it's not against Islam. Then they spoke with them and they said only, uh, they are allowed only to go up to sixth grade. And then uh, the elder girls were coming, we just changed the, the board on the classroom. It was first A, B, C, so we had every, all of um, 12 up under the sixth grade. <laughs> And the good part was uh, Taliban was not going to the classroom because they are Pashtun and that area is Hazaras. So they were not very much into the, into the uh, local uh, small businesses. So one of them went later in the evening and told the watchman, they'll give you some money. You tell me why there's a lot of bigger girls coming to school. He said they are all teachers. <laughs> the only girls' schools, girls' high schools, there were some primary schools, but the only girls' high school under the Taliban was my girls' schools. And then when the uh, Taliban was out by the Americans and the others, uh, for next year, in 2002, in, uh, we had the Concord exam for admission in the university. And the Ministry of Education was not accepting that they were high school for the girls. And I had to fight that yes, they were high school. And they, uh, it was really a lot of... Uh, um, fighting with the ministry to recognize that, yes, they were high school, I mean, otherwise they will not be able to pass the exam. How do we know? I mean, you come and see. Let's go to the region and see that it, is, it was really existing. There's a register book, there's a, a teachers, when they teach and they sign from when to when what they thought, math or, or geography or history, everything is there. So the registration of these girls from the first grade up to 12 is there. So you can see all these proof, we did not made it. So it took, um, but we were able to put them to that. And most of them really got uh, graduated from university. They, a lot of them got scholarship outside of the country. And a lot of them were studying in India. And I think uh, when they were already in eight grades, then some of them were engaged, because usually they engage early. And they said they're not going to marry unless they finish their education. And then the, the local people and some of the mullahs and elderly complaining, it's your school, now the girls are standing up for their, that they don't want to, to marry. And I said, well, their child, under 18 is child, so don't push for child marriages. Now they, now I'm, I'm happy that at least in maybe four or five districts, there's no child left behind without school. But in the other areas also, it's much more than 
than the normal districts of Afghanistan. From this district, we have more medical doctors than more, maybe more than three provinces in the other part of the country. Because they go to school and then they go to medical, uh, to study medicine. Yes. And then uh, you were minister for some time. Yes. As I said, that women were completely ignored. I was lobbying for women's inclusion by, uh, um, with everyone, including to the United Nations, because even the United Nations was ignoring women. I remember when the, um, 1998, when the Russian left the country, UNDP came in open office to, uh, for the Af Afghanistan. And uh, I went to see this man. He was an American, actually. I called and I went to, to see him. So I said, I'm very happy that UNDP finally came, so we will have some development program for Afghanistan. And of course, do you have specific projects for women? And he said, women? No, we don't have a woman uh, project for women. And I said, um, how do you work on development without women? Because do you think if women are not involved in development, would that be development? Would that be complete? He said, I haven't seen any Afghan woman. I've been to Logar, one of the province which is quite close to Kabul, for a week and I haven't seen any woman. And I said, just for your information, all these heroes who kicked out the USSR from Afghanistan are not dropped from the sky. They are born of a woman. They have mothers. And of course he was shocked. He was kind of a... He should be, because why he should be so naive? And then he said that... Uh, I said, can I be a representative of Afghan women? He looked at me, he said, are you Afghan? I thought you are French. And I said, no, I have green eyes, but I'm an Afghan. Then he said, of course, he, they don't have any program, but in 1993, he moved to FAO. And then he called me, he said, come and have some project, because <laughs> I was so <laughs> naive. We had a quite a, a difficult time, so I was lobbying and I was, uh, although I was medical doctor, but I was really very much on, on women's rights. And I was following all these CEDAWs, the international conferences on women, Beijing platform of action and all those things. Although I was not in Beijing, because uh, I don't know why, because the Afghan government did not allow the delegate to go to Beijing. They did not allow the delegate to 1994, the population conference in Cairo also, because they said they are discussing un-Islamic issues. So, but I think few Afghan women went from Pakistan, but I was not part of the, uh, the delegation. But I was following because it was, uh, uh, that was my interest. So I was lobbying all the time for women's rights and I, anyway. Then when it came, Mujahideen went in Afghanistan and they established interim administration and there were no women, of course. So we went out and had a big demonstration that there's no women. In, the, in Pakistan, actually. I might have some of the photos, but I have to find it was the photos, not digital, on that time. Uh, we had a big demonstration because it was no women and no minorities. Then uh, fighting with everyone, going uh, everywhere, and had some, uh, some uh, connection with some women. So I came to Germany exactly the same day with Terdefam. 
The same day when the American began the bombing in Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, and I came to, uh, to Germany to their conference, to the Farm conference, I was speaking there. Then they organized a whole a long uh, public speeches. So I was talking around uh, in Germany with radios. Yeah, it was really a lot of interest because that was the beginning of the bombing. Before that, actually, I was lobbying against Taliban, attending different conferences and talking, lobbying with Americans uh, that they should not recognize Taliban. So I was in Germany in 1998 when Ima Bunino, who was the EU Commission, she went to Kabul and she wanted to take photograph uh, of the female hospital and she was arrested by Taliban. So it came in the media that she was arrested. So I was in Germany calling her. And uh, I called. She said, why don't you come tomorrow to Brussels? Because we are going to have a press conference on women. She made a flower for women in Afghanistan, the 8th March of 98. So I went to his office. We had a press conference, and I was under the burqa. She brought a burqa from Afghanistan with her as a souvenir. So I wore that burqa and sat in the press conference and talked against the Taliban and uh, Taliban oppression. And of course, criticized the international community also. So that's why they were, uh, I was known somehow in fighting. I was in Germany when they um, find me in Bonn and they said, Lakhtar Ibrahimi wants to, to see you in the US. And UN was following me. Give me your passport. And, and I said, well, I think um, I'm still holding the American visa one year, multiple, because I was going once or twice a year in some conferences and so on. And it was not as restricted that they are today. So uh, I said, I do have a visa, but I'm not going to see him in, in New York. If he wants to see me, he should come to, Afghan to Pakistan. So the same bold. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think much, I just respond. <laughs> then I went to Pakistan, and I, there was uh, a man from S Spain. A uh, very famous diplomat, uh, Von Rill. He was the uh, SRSG, the special representative of Secretary General for Afghanistan. So I flew from Koita to Islamabad and told him that you should include women on the negotiation, not Sima Samar. Anyone you can do but not Sima Samar, because if you don't do it at the beginning, it will be very difficult. So I had a one hour fighting with him, and it should be, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not here because of myself, um, but women should be included. So then it was a conference uh, uh, organized by World Bank the, on the reconstruction of Afghanistan. Still, the negotiation was going on. So in that conference, Still, a photograph of that time is in the, uh, in the YouTube. I don't know who put it, because a Norwegian um, journalist asked me, what do you think? And I said, no, I don't believe they are the warlords who are sitting in the bun and <laughs> negotiating the peace. I just said it like this, and, and he took my photograph this in the same manner, <laughs> but then uh, I was going to uh, to Canada to receive the John Humphrey uh, Award. So they, in the same meeting, they came with the list that there's a uh, with the Bonn Conference. There's a civil society. So my name was there, and I said, "I'm sorry, I'm going to Canada. I don't believe that they will really uh, reach to any agreement because it was a lot of bargaining." But then 5th of December, I was uh, again in Canada. I was going to different 
different uh, talking tour in different city. We were in Vancouver. We were flying to Edmonton that morning. Early morning, my telephone ran, rang, and I pick it up. It was my son from U.S. He said, "You become minister." And I said, "What?" He said, "You." or vice chair for Karzai and also minister of women's affairs. And I said, who's saying? He said, BBC and CNN is saying. <laughs> I said, I, I don't know, nobody, nobody contacted me. So I went and took a hot shower. There was a Canadian girl who was accompanying me. She's very nice. And after the shower, I. I took shower to be awake. Am I sleeping or what do I see? I mean, I, then I knock her door. I said, Isabel, you know that I become a minister. <laughs> so anyway, we had the early morning flight. So we went to, we took the flight to Edmonton. As soon as we arrive in Edmonton, um, they announced that Sima Samar, please, uh, come to the staff. And I went there, it was protocol officer, and it was limousine, it was bodyguards. <laughs> then they re really received me very, very well. They took me to, uh, to the parliament, and I had a meeting with the prime minister of Canada, and they really praised me a lot. And I was shocked. <laughs> anyway, my plan was, it was December, so I thought that I would go during the uh, Christmas, I'll stay with my family, with my son uh, and my brothers in, in Texas. But then I received the call that you should stop in Washington. So I stopped in Washington and I had a meeting with Colin Powell, who was the foreign minister. So I told him, I said, uh, Paul, uh, I'm a woman, I'm Hazara, and I'm bold. So, who I was put in this list. The failure of this government will be the failure of U.S. So, who's going to give to provide protection for me? It's all the warlords who are ministers. And he turned his face. He said. Uh, Sima, I fully understand because I'm the first black foreign minister or state secretary in this country. So I understand you will receive, get protection from us. But then uh, I said, I have few demands from you. One, please do not trust the warlords that you made for Afghanistan before. Two, Please spend as much money as you're spending on bombing on Afghanistan. He said, do you know how much? And I said, no, I just guess it's a lot. Three, do not forget women. And then when we went to press club, and I said the same thing in the, in the press. And then I flew to Pakistan. As soon as I arrived in Pakistan, it was thousands of people receiving me from the airport. I was already a celebrity. <laughs> and then I uh, went to Islamabad and I took the UN flight to Kabul. It was very interesting because our staff, um, two of my staff volunteered from the hospital in, in Pakistan and went to Afghanistan to prepare. They rented a house. They came to the, um, they brought the car of one of the hospitals that I was running in Afghanistan to Kabul because we didn't have anything. So they rented a house, but the house had very old furniture, nothing else. When I arrived, they went to some Hazara family in order to bring some mattresses and quilt to sleep. This is the vice president of Afghanistan. <laughs> The next day, there was an American lady who was in Pakistan during the bombing. 
the night when the bombs began in Afghanistan. Um, I saw her the day before, and she came with some um, American fr friend. New, uh, let me send me an email. So she was stuck in the uh, Sarina Hotel in Kuwait because they didn't allow the foreign journalists to to collect the information because the Pakistanis uh, Taliban had a big demonstration that day in Pakistan. So what I did, I called her, I said, I'm coming to the hotel, then I'll take you with my car. So I went to the hotel because I was somehow known to some people in the 17 years and I was fighting all the time. So I went to, with my car to the hotel and then I put her in my car. Then when we got out, the police on the, on the gate did not realize. And then the other one, her friend, another journalist from, she is Tristan, Tristan Amor. She is now working for BBC. That time she was on Channel 4. So we told her that she climbed the, the door. We are waiting for her outside. She climbed the wall and we took her out. They were the two who sent the first report to there. So she came to Afghanistan and she said, do you have, do you know Hamid Karzai? And I said, no. And she said, do you have his telephone number? And I said, no. And she said, I can give you the phone number. Because a friends, a feminist majority in Washington, they bought me a satellite phone from uh, through some urgent action fund and they said that they are going to pay the bill because it was three dollar per minute so i called karzai i said uh, mr president i'm one of your ministers <laughs> i'm sima samar <laughs> then he said come to the palace tomorrow because that 21st of December 2001 was the date when the power transfer was done from the Northern Alliance to our government. So I was minister for six months. But I had very, very difficult time because no money, nothing, no office. And you gave me only one desk, one computer. One satellite phone, but I was not using because I was not sure who's going to pay the bill. And uh, one chair. So we had the. Until, for two months, I didn't have any office. After two months, I pushed one, uh, one warlord's son from the structure, which was previously a woman association. And I said, I want this. Beside that, there was a cinema which was named on behalf of a lady and it was burned by Taliban. So I said, I want that because symbolically this belonged to women. So I pushed that one and he, when he left, he even took out the, um, the socket for the electricity. It was really cold, 22nd of uh, February. So I went to that office and UNDP gave me this uh, one desk, one computer, one chair. And the lady, uh, uh, f she was from Sweden. She was w responsible for human rights with the EU. She came and she saw that it's really cold. She went out without saying anything. She came later with the electrical heater. You were so cold, I brought this from my own uh, office. And I said, I don't have electricity, so look, the, the socket are not working. <laughs> we didn't have electricity. So I was preparing for first eight March in 2002, and we didn't have anything. So the, and I wanted to do, have the program in that, uh, uh, in that cinema. So the American ambassador wanted to give us money, $9,000, to clean up because it was really full of um, trashes and burning of everything, actually. 
he was coming. He said that if I could come to the embassy, and I said, oh, well, I'm vice president and minister, so why don't you come to my office for this agreement signing off? So he was coming, and I didn't have the second chair. So I sent some of my staff to find plastic chairs, and I paid myself to enable us to, to sign the contract. It was really difficult time, but we had a very, very good uh, um, emotional day of 8 March. Mary Robinson came, and Nulin Heiser, who was the head, chair of the head of UNIFAM, she came. Um, the regional director of UNIFPA uh, was a Palestinian woman. She came. Um, we had the female minister of women's affairs of Pakistan who came and she also brought the cover a tent for the roof because it was open. We were not sure if it was raining. It was 8 March. It was a really cold day. We invited 800 people. Then the uh, different NGOs came. What do, should we do? Give me a chair. I mean, it was not available in the market in Kabul, so they collected chair, different kind of chairs from everywhere. So we had a very nice celebration. Karzai came and spoke, uh, Lakhtar Ibrahimi spoke, and I spoke. We have, um, we brought some white, three white pigeons that we released them in the, uh, in the program. That was first nice emotional action. Then I was there for uh, six months. Then we had this, next day we had the uh, workshop on human rights. Then Mary Robinson was the High Commissioner for Human Rights on that time. And they uh, asked me to lead the workshop. So I lead the workshop. At the end of the day they announced I was already so tired because I didn't sleep for three, four nights because of 8 March. And then uh, they said that I should chair the, the human rights uh, workshop the whole day. So I did that. Uh, at the end of the day, they announced that I should be the focal point from the government side for establishment of the Human Rights Commission, as I didn't have enough work. So I pushed Karzai. So Karzai had a dinner for Mary Robinson. And then she said that because Sima doesn't have a lot of work, we give her another responsibility. We were able to do the work and uh, establish the Human Rights Commission. And then we had emergency lawyer Jirga, when the fundamentalist was really against me. So the day when we were planning to, uh, to have the emergency lawyer Jirga, because the interim administration was six months. So we should have had the emergency lawyer Jirga, and then the lawyer Jirga would have decided about the future transitional government in Afghanistan. We went there, and one of the newspapers from running by the Jamiat Islami group was written that Sima Samar said she doesn't believe on Sharia law. She is not Muslim, she has to be accountable, she... Uh, and uh, we, we went there, they, it was... They distributed widely among the delegates. And it was interesting because, except those people on the leadership of that, uh, Jamiat Islami and another Ittad Islami, the other were not responding to it. So we began that day and everybody was very much worried. The radio television was under control of the same, per, the same men who was running this newspaper. And they were making a lot of propaganda against me in the, new, in the radio. So it was really tough time. But the next day I decided to stand for the vice chair of the lawyer. I wanted the reaction of the people. And then I won the, the election. I got the highest number of votes from the people, mainly men, not women. 
and I became the first vice chair of the Loya Jirge. As soon as I went to take the position, these people be, took the microphone. She is not Muslim, she doesn't have to sit there. And I was quiet and smiling to them. Then when it was my turn, I said, you already used your right. You didn't vote for me. You do not have the right to shout at me. I said, just get out of this tent and see the destruction which was made by you people. You all have to be accountable for what you have done. I was, I was not afraid, actually. <laughs> then it was, um, they were shouting at me every day, but I, I really didn't care. I was laughing louder when they were shouting. So it showed that, the, for me, I, I thought that I will test. First of all, I was put there without, I mean, I was not elected, I was selected. Two, how much they really believe on this newspaper and the extremist idea. So interestingly, they, the people were not believing on their opinion and ideas. So that was, uh, and they really wanted to kill me after I didn't give up. So there was a day, uh, a night, the last night of, uh, next day was the last day, but the, the last night of the Loya Jirga, United Nations DSRSG, the deputy of the uh, special representative of Kofi Annan at that time, he came to our house with the tank and took me from my house because they wanted to kill me, to a uh, UN guest house. I spent the night over there. There have always been a lot of threats. It's always, always. Then they were negotiating with Karzai that she should not be in position of power. Then Karzai was trying to convince me, uh, you can be Minister of Women's Affairs, but not Vice President. And I said, well, I don't want to be in a position that you don't. I said, I am Vice President and Minister of Women's Affairs. When I raise my hand, you don't give me a chance to speak. I don't want to sit at the end of the table. And uh, he said, no, 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 you still can sit beside me. And I said, no, I, I'm not in love with your face. I want a real power. Then he said, why don't you, you're interested on Human Rights Commission, why don't you? Then they were thinking that the Human Rights Commission would not be very serious. So, but then when it became serious, they were again shouting that, but they couldn't remove, now they are somehow accepting my position and my role. And I keep imposing myself on them. <laughs> yeah. It's a difficult, it's very difficult, but I think I'm, I'm happy because uh, the improvement that we achieved in human rights is exceptional in our region. And we have this Asia Pacific Forum of all the national institutions of human rights in Asia Pacific. We are one of the, the biggest, one of the, the let's say, the, the good one in a difficult country. And generally, uh, with all over the world, with ICC, there's um, 78 or 72 National Institution of Human Rights, which has the accreditation. Uh, I think we are, we are the biggest and we are the most effective one. None of these conflict countries has, except Palestine. Palestine has, the rest, uh, and Palestinian also in a very difficult situation. Yeah, it's a lot to say, it's a lot to do, it's, uh, we still have very unclear situation, but I, I, 
personally, I'm hopeful. We don't give up. Yes. So you were nominated. Well, <clears throat> yes, I think uh, first of all I, I met Gobi before the um, establishment of this 1000 Women for Nobel Peace Prize. Because when I was lobbying, walking around in this country, fundraising to, for my, uh, some of my projects, and also lobbying politically, I met her when she was member of the conference, uh, con member of the parliament. And then in 2003, when she began this, she invited uh, me to be one of the uh, in the conference with this 1,000 women for Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I think we uh, we did a good work, and I have to say that it was not just by the Nobel Peace Committee that they did not give to 1,000 women, but they gave it to Albrighty that year. We all remember. Anyway, but we did... Uh, I was nominated for Nobel Peace Prize, I think, uh, almost three times. I don't know who, who, who did it. But once, when it was really close to, to get it, was 2009, when uh, <coughs> I was shortlisted and Obama shortlisted, and they gave it to Obama. And I remember when I interviewed with different, uh, different media, because um, it was really high on the list, and I said, maybe he has more responsibility than I do, or he is more capable to bring peace than I do. But anyway, um, next year again I was uh, shortlisted, but it was given to the Chinese who was in prison. Um, I think for me, I keep saying that, that the work that I do is not for Nobel Peace Prize, but uh, and that level, it's a recognition of the work that I do, is something. But they sh it would have been much, um, nice for Afghanistan because we always hear um, explosion, killing, beheading, uh, bad news. It would have been nice to get it if there's a good news from Afghanistan. But anyway, as I said, that I'm not working for for. Uh, peace prizes or for prizes, but I got enough um, prizes here and there. I got the alternative Nobel Peace Prize in 2012. And uh, so I, I think, uh, I don't know, somehow everything is very much political. But we, with our network, and I think, um, particularly when you say now we collect one million women's um, stories, yeah. it's really wor and good. At least we collect the history. At least we recognize the suffering and the sacrifice of women for peace. We, we acknowledge the discrimination exists against women. And this is something that we should continue. <laughs>